Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Unscripted and Unchained RPG Review. I am DM Bloodworth and as you can see by the graphics, I'm going to be taking a look at old school renaissance like a effing boss. Uh, change it a little bit there. Uh, this is by Avenger Satanus. This is a uh, this is a free PDF that he put out uh, just a couple days ago, and it's it's basically a a hints and tips PDF, uh, nine pages long, that uh, just kind of like how to role play or or DM in an old school Renaissance way. And so uh, it's very similar to the type of um, the type of supplement that that was put out by Monty Cook Games uh, a couple months ago, dealing with uh, consent in gaming. And so, although this one is very very different than consent in gaming, and as I will go back and forth and talk a little bit about how this particular uh, hints and tips. PDF uh, is different from that other one because it's a it's a it's a totally different perspective to gaming and and you'll see that as I go through. Now there's about thirty seven points that uh, Venger makes in this and and I'm not going to focus on all of them. It is free. You can get it on uh, Drive Through RPG, and so you're you know, able to go through there, and I'll I'll have the link. Uh, my drive through RPG link is in the description of all of my videos, so you can always hop in there, and then just access it and pick it up there, along with some of his other products as well. So he he does have a number of of different game products out there that you might also want to take a look at. And there there seems to be some others that are like how to GM like an effing boss, how to be a player like an effing boss. So he this is part of a series. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump right into the PDF and and go over it point by point with you. And like I said, I will gloss over a few of them along the way um, because they're kind of self-explanatory. So let me just switch views here and open up that. So here we have uh, old school renaissance like an effing boss. And he, he starts off by explaining what the OSR is. And basically the OSR, um, although the acronym kind of changes, and he shows that a little bit here, Old School Renaissance, Old School Revival. Uh, I've even seen and, and used myself Old School Role Playing, because uh, if you go back to the way that at least I w w was playing back in the late 70s, early 80s, um, I call it more Old School Role Playing, because just the focus of, of how we played the games back then is totally different than uh, what you might experience today, um, especially with like 5e groups and such. And I'll get into that a little bit more in detail. So little introduction that he does here. Um, and here we go with the rules. And like I said, I'm not going to go over all of these uh, in great detail, but you have rule zero and you rule one. I'm going to compare those together. Um, you're, you're the game master. It's your game. You're not bound by any stinking rules. You, your will is divine. And, and this is the same as a rule zero in Dungeons and Dragons as well. Uh, the, the game master is the ultimate arbiter of all rules. It is your game world. It is your adventure. The players are impacting that uh, through their actions, but it's basically, you know, your rules, your world, your story, and ultimately your table, if we, if we want to talk about being meta about it. Um, so this is your game. Uh, see rule number zero. Game master, don't let anyone bully you, push you around, or tell you how to run it, but don't be so prideful that you're deaf to helpful suggestions and constructive criticism, uh, which kind of comes after the after the fact. So if, if your players are kind of telling you, listen, we really didn't like the way that this adventure went, or you know, we didn't like using this particular rule, you know, you should be 
you know, you should have an open ear to that kind of thing and say, hey, you know what, maybe I'll try this, you know, differently. If, however, they're saying, well, we really don't like this content at all, then, you know, that's, that's where you have to start questioning, well, you know, this is the kind of game that I want to play. This is the, this is the adventure as it was explained. And if you're not okay with that, then you as a player might want to consider, you know, not, not continue, continuing in this session or not continuing in this campaign or whatever, um, because it is going to continue going that way. And that goes back to rule zero, you know, and the first part of rule number one here. And that is a big departure from what Monty Cook Games had put out in their Consent in Gaming uh, PDF, which I have a video on my channel that um, where, where I describe my take from that particular uh, PDF and, and my objections to it and, you know, what, what few elements of it I found were kind of a strong point. Uh, as well. So none of these things are going to be perfect, you know, and and you agree with all of these different points or you might not, you know, disagree with all of these, you know, points as well. So having fun is rule number two. You know, I personally would put that as rule number one, but, uh, but rule number two is to have fun. Uh, don't waste time. Time is of the essence, so don't waste it. Keep this thing moving along. Players or their characters are stuck in the gameplay, uh, has stalled gently nudge them along and some game systems actually do this automatically um, if they're using like a doom pool or or some other kind of a GM mechanic where the GM can start uh, you know rolling for additional random monsters or you know just to move the the players along as well so it's it's not quite railroading uh, in essence but it is kind of moving them moving the pace along because, you know, in many cases, you know, we, we're, we don't have unlimited time to play these games. You know, a lot of times you might have a three or four hour block, or if you're at a convention, that's certainly where you're going to be tied to, where you have a four hour block to finish this thing up. And if the players are dilly dallying, you have to nudge them along. Uh, rule five is reactions. So not every monster or humanoid is hostile and immediately attacks, you know, and between reactions and morale, those are two things that, you know, um, we oftentimes we forget. And so I really like the fact that he mentions these kind of early on, is that, you know, you, know, you see that orc in a, in a tunnel, um, that orc isn't always going to immediately just, you know, attack you, you know, mindlessly. And, um, or it's not going to continue to... Uh, to fight to the death every single time. And so reactions and morale are, are kind of important. And once in a while, I, I mean, I've played some game systems where the morale of the players and their characters is, um, you know, is not entirely within their control as well. And so they can suddenly lose control of their own character's nerve in, in a combat situation. And, you know, it, it forces them to to either suffer the consequences of you know negative roles or whatever uh, uh, modifiers to their roles or you know they might completely lose control of their character and their character flees you know and then they have to make successive roles in order to regain their control and and this is something where I see like a, a an ongoing debate uh, about uh, gaming where player agency of their own characters uh, kind of runs against these like rule zero and rule one and you know ultimately you know and I'll get I'll get back into this a little bit later as well you know ultimately it becomes an old school versus new school uh, role-playing you know argument that I don't think that there's an easy answer for but uh, We'll continue on here. So seven is minimal preparation. Um, and, and, and that gets to, you know, being kind of flexible, you know, so, you know, don't be over prepared, but, you know, have some ideas, you know, preset for where you're looking to go. Keep the players playing. 
So uh, if if a player dies, and I, I think that's that's mainly what what this is dealing with, even if the character is dead or unconscious, get them back into the game within a few minutes or within 15 minutes. In other words, don't just have the player sitting there and oh well, my my character just died, and so I have no other no other role to play in this. Uh, bring 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 the player back into the gaming session uh, in some meaningful and and innovative way I mean you can have you know you can have an encounter where going back to those morale checks um, maybe that player can uh, take control of an NPC and play out that character for the remainder of the adventure or, or until they once again uh, get killed and that might be at least something that, that keeps them engaged and, and that certainly will keep them better engaged than all right well your character died uh, you can go replenish our chip bowl or you know get another six pack of beer uh, while we continue playing. Progression always give the players incentives small small pieces of rewards as they're going along that just keep things flowing and moving forward and and encourage them for making, uh, you know, making wise decisions, and it can be reflective of experience points gained if you do that um, ongoing experience point gain, rather than, you know, backloading adventure parts or the entire adventure, and that's when the player characters receive their experience points. Uh, rule ten: Explain the value. So why is this adventure important? You might have to remind them from time to time, um, remind them why they're adventuring. So, you know, all 10 and 11 kind of, you know, tie into each other. Inspire, do not direct. Either let the PCs come to you and meet with you half, meet with them halfway. Uh, play it cool. Don't be too eager when engaging the world around them. Otherwise, you may come up as desperate and the lack of Verismith, uh, I can't say that word. Um, well, weaken immersion. Um, so basically, don't give them too much information. You'll kind of break your own world by doing that. Random encounters, so keep things kind of interesting and, and unpredictable. And even for yourself, uh, as a GM, it's, it's always good to, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm, I have to be kind of on my toes. Uh, here as well. Uh, I'm not following this script, you know, as as is. So shorter combat. Um, I'm going to disagree a little bit with this in that I don't think it's necessarily shorter combat is better combat. I think that having fewer combat situations, but having them much more detailed and meaningful is actually better than just having shorter combat. Um, so it's just a, a quality over quantity and, um, and the length of time really doesn't make that much of a difference in my mind. You could have a long lasting combat sequence that, uh, is, is really meaningful and really engaging and that would be better than having just a very short combat sequence that well mechanically it runs faster and and smoother and and such and there's there's either even if there is the same amount at stake um making it shorter doesn't necessarily make it better um moving on and and, and that might that might require some some back and forth feedback with, uh, you know, hopefully Venger watches this uh, video and uh, and he and I can have a discussion about this where he can explain where he's coming from more so on rule number 14. Motivate your NPCs. Uh, he kind of, he, he does this thing with the NPCs, like the NPCs are not all, all that important, but then he talks about motivating them. So that, that's another section where I'm like, oh, it's, it's kind of, you're, you're telling me two different things here. So 15 is motivate your NPCs when role playing an NPC. Remember to ask yourself, what is the motivation of this NPC? Um, and I, let me see if I, did I skip that? I thought it was earlier. 
but maybe not. But uh, I'll keep that in mind. 15 and there's something else the, um, that relates to that. The three strikes in your dead rule. Um, players basically should, their characters should die if they make a, mis like a, a stupid mistake. If they have some really bad, unfortunate uh, dice rolls. Or just a, you know, just a fluke thing uh, has occurred. Uh, when all three things occur, um, that's when a player character will generally die. And he's basically saying, you know, generally speaking, don't let just one of those elements do it. So that poor decision uh, or bad luck or unfortunate situation don't let, like, allow there to be a get out from doing one of those things. Uh, but doing two or three of those things should lead to a character's death if, if that's the way it plays out. And, and don't be overly concerned about a character dying in your game session. Measured verbosity. Provide all relevant information up front and extraneous details only when asked for by the players. You don't give them too much, uh, too much information, just enough to get them through. Uh, defer to player skill. And what I like to do here is, uh, you know, so when it says defer to player skill, if the player skill handles it well enough, don't worry too much about what's on the character sheet. Uh, after all, the PC is merely the player's avatar in the world. What I think you might be referring to here is that uh, I, I tell my players to look over their character sheet and use every aspect of that character sheet. Don't just be tied down to these specific skills or, or spells or whatever that they have, but look at their attributes and look at their durability scores and... and you know, think of think of different ways to use this so that, you know, if I don't have a skill to do a particular item, but maybe one of my attributes might might explain how I can, you know, still make that attempt, then use that. You know, don't just focus on what are my character's combat skills, but what are the things that my character's background might lend that character to attempting. <coughs> Describe the action is 19 uh, when possible. So it's describe attacks, maneuvers, and significant actions on both sides, uh, particularly embellishing the killing blow, which is something that I do all the time. Um, I, I even try to create that sense of, you know, a, a slow motion action when someone gets that critical hit and, you know, we roll the, um, we roll the hit location or if it was a, 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 a targeted attack where they, you know, specifically were aiming for a particular part and they, they still look at that critical hit and, you know, I always go into a great deal of detail uh, for those events because that, that really does add that dynamic, cinematic uh, feel to the combat. And, and that goes back to the point I was making earlier to have much more detailed combat, maybe fewer instances of it, but to you know have those those combat rounds uh, fill in that space of the adventure. The Trinity, exploration, combat, and social interaction, and and I I develop my my adventures in a very similar way. The only thing that I would include in this um, is. And, and perhaps it falls under exploration, but uh, lore. I like for the characters to gain a certain amount of knowledge of the world that they're playing in. And so exploration doesn't necessarily have to be the, the physical travel and exploring. Uh, it could be the mental, you know, an academic uh, exploration of the world that the players are in. And so... Uh, they walk away with a little bit of knowledge about the world that their characters are, are adventuring in. And the combat and the social interaction. Again, there's, there's, the social interaction is going to happen. 
I, I wouldn't necessarily, amongst the players in a meta sense and amongst the characters in their group dynamic. And so it's not necessarily a Trinity item, I don't think. Um, you know, I like, I like combat, travel, and, or, or environmental um, possibilities and uh, knowledge being gained. So, you know, I have a slightly different Trinity than he does. The two and six, two and six when in doubt, give the single, uh, give the thing, whatever it may be, a two and six chance of occurring. And and getting back to where I was talking about, well, if you don't necessarily have a skill, but you have an attribute that might be able to do that, uh, give the player a, a, a two and six chance of using their attribute to cover something where their skills don't necessarily do it. They say it, they do it. I love this rule. All right, this rule not only moves the action forward a little faster, which gets to one of his previous points, but um, it does it does give player agency because now what they say, their character is doing, and no one else can interfere with it at that moment. What they can try to do is try to either enhance it or mitigate it after they've already seen it take place. So if the player says that his character does X, then the attempt is now being made. Anyone can attempt to stop the character or the action from taking place, but not retroactively interfere with the original action. So, so basically, uh, it, it is holding the, it's holding the player accountable. When they say their character is doing something, you immediately assume that they've done it. Uh, or at least they've, they've started it to the point that they can't just backtrack right then. They'll have to come up with a different action to take it back, um, or at least attempt to take it back. And, and based on the situation, that might not be possible. Keeping things in mix three, so don't over-explain, which he kind of covered that uh, earlier. Doom, whenever possible, foreshadow the terrible fate that will befall the PCs if it's continuing to pursue their present course of action. One thing I like to do is um, I, I, I like to have the players understand or develop an understanding that the world that they're adventuring in is a dangerous place. And, you know, sometimes because, you know, if the players are very skilled and they're, they're properly cautious about what they're doing with their characters, uh, it tends to become difficult for them to lose lose their characters. They they tend not to get killed, uh, and and if they go a long span without any of their characters actually dying, they're they're going to start to um, lose that sense of this is a dangerous world we're in. And and so to build up doom, sometimes what I've done is uh, I, I've had them grow attached to. An NPC that's working with them as a you know as a hireling or henchman or, or something similar, and then killing off that NPC, and then making the the players feel responsible that that happened and you know a lot and in the cases when I've done it they've actually been like oh man that, it's it's terrible that this happened and they and they you know really lament over the fact that they didn't do what they were supposed to do or or they could have done more in order to protect that, that character. And, you know, I've actually had them go out and, you know, you know be really pissed off and, and, and go out and take revenge for their guide getting killed, um, which was the most recent time that I've used that. So Doom doesn't always have to be something that's, that's felt just by uh, the player characters. It could be, it could be visited upon uh, other NPCs that they actually care about. Critical encounters. Um, so critical successes and failures happen seldom, make them significant moments of adventure. Uh, roll once. Uh, I, I also like doing secret rolls. Like you roll, you roll like a roll that doesn't mean anything, and that that's also an, another way to keep the players kind of a little bit uneasy. So getting back to the doom or getting the players to move faster ahead. Uh, so every once in a while, you, you, as a DM behind your screen, you just start rolling and they start, hey, what was that for? 
you know, and you tell them, you know, I'll let you know when you have to worry about it, but just keep on work, you know, just keep on playing. And, you know, it kind of gets them on the spot. Rulings on the spot. Don't be afraid to make a ruling on the spot. Split second decisions based on the relevant information at the hand is part of your job. Where it goes back to rule zero and rule one. The benefit of the doubt. If there's been a misunderstanding, give the player or the players the benefit of the doubt without retconning or retroactively changing the past. Um, for example, Balk is your Balk is your Balk is sure he mentioned bringing those healing potions along. Oh yeah, I remember the scene, Eric, reading this. Um, so the player's pretty sure that they brought something, but they don't actually have it on their sheet. And instead of saying, well, all right, yeah, you have all six healing potions that you forgot to put on your sheet, you say, well, you know, you don't really know, you know, what could have happened to them, but you did manage to find one. And so you're not totally penalizing them for not having anything, but you are giving them at least one and it'll make them a little bit more uh, cognizant of their responsibility to make sure that they're jotting the things down on their character sheet before they begin the adventure. Abstract combat. Using a one minute round gives you plenty of leeway in combat. Plenty of reasonable actions are possible in 60 seconds. And then that's because most game systems use like a six second and, and sometimes it doesn't make much sense. Um, that, you know, how am I going to travel 40 feet, as he uses in the example here, and then aim and fire my crossbow inside of six seconds. So um, you can just take the, the timing out of it altogether and just say, you know, you have a combat round. You don't have to get into how long or short it is. Um, just like a, an explanation I had is like when you when you're in combat and you do you know, D6 damage and you've done six points, it doesn't necessarily mean that all six of those points of damage when you're in a, when you're in a melee came from you just swinging that, uh, that sword. Uh, that could include, well, during the fight, you've, you've swung your sword, you've, you've kicked the person in the kneecap, you've elbowed them once in the, in this, the scrum of this combat, you might have, you know, hit them with your shield or whatever, there could be a, a, a wide range of what's going on during that combat round that you know isn't necessarily just attributed to um, the weapon damage that you've done. It, they, they could be you know a bulk of it, but you don't have to get down to well these six points came directly from your you know your sword that you swung. There could be other things thrown in there. Rule 30. All right, now I found it. Uh, rule 30, your NPCs suck. Players don't want to hear the extensive background or irrelevant monologue of precious NPCs. Uh, NPCs, and, I, and, I, and I've described this in my own, you know, in some of my own conversations uh, on different gaming sites where NPCs to me are kind of like the background noise or part of the blur. What I describe as the blur of the world around them and the real focus is on the player characters and and their group and if, if that means that they're going to gain this sense of uh, superiority over everything else around the world well that's kind of the point is that you're you're playing somebody who is exceptional and um or at least mentally they believe that they're exceptional and the world around them doesn't you know, if it's not a self-centered view, you know, it's it's in the blur. They, they, they really don't, they don't see that barmaid across the table, you know, across the room uh, doing something unless there's, there's some connection, you know, that they're looking to make in that. So um, I wouldn't, you know, I agree with them here that the players, you know, don't want to hear this kind of stuff. It's not important. If it's not important, we get into that whole thing of, well, you know, your world has to have, you know, this this well-developed NPCs all over the place, and you see all different types and and you know the the you know mod diversity 
kind of argument made that they should see all of these different things in the world. Um, players don't need that. Players just want to deal with an NPC when they have to, you know, if they if they have to buy something, if they need a guide, if they need some information, you know, it, it, what is that individual NPC going to do for them in the cause of them running their adventure? And, you know, after that adventure is over, they no longer may need to talk to this NPC ever again. They may move on to another place. So don't waste too much time uh, putting all of that into your NPCs. The, the, the player characters really don't care. Story emerges from play. And yes, and, and this gets back to, you know, where you may have the story in your mind as the, as the GM and then the the players are going to more inform that story. They're they're going to shift it in directions that you might not be expecting. Uh, that doesn't mean that you lose the the very essence of your story, but it does mean that you have to you know anticipate that your story is going to evolve and change over some time based on on the players' choices with their characters. Keep it challenging, so don't don't have your adventures be too, you know, too easy, too um, or too difficult. You want you want them to be challenging. Skip a bit. Not everything has to be role played out, um, and that goes back to the flushing out those NPCs or or the unnecessary amount of you know flushing them out. Uh, overrule your dice. He. He talks here about once per session, give yourself permission to refute, ignore, overrule, or modify a roll, score, result, or bothersome number. Um, I mean, I, I can go back and forth on this as far as, you know, I let the, let the dice decide 100% um, of the time. If I'm going to fudge rolls, why would I limit myself to once per session? Um, that to me, it's like either you, you don't fudge rolls or, you know, it's got to be a really, really good reason why I would fudge a roll to begin with. And I wouldn't want to say, well, once per session, I'm going to fudge a roll or I'm never going to fudge a roll. You know, I, I, I don't want either extreme and, and wouldn't do that. Um, sometimes it's important to, uh, you know, to let the dice speak for what, what occurs. The time is now. Start gaming ASAP. All right, so he's basically telling you, you know, get in there. Um, one of the biggest inhibitors to players becoming GMs is that fear of taking on that responsibility. And basically, I, I think that the fastest and the the really the best way of becoming a GM and becoming a good GM is to get out there and, and start doing it, you know, right away. Um, as soon as you know 80% of the rules, you're ready to GM. And, you know, you start with small adventures and you build up from there. And uh, you, you keep the various components of what makes a good adventure uh, in there. Uh, move it along. This could be an hour-long adventure, and you just become comfortable doing it. And and so and he's right here in, in that the time is now, is you know start doing it fairly quickly. Uh, after learning how to play the game, you know playing it a few times as a as a player character, and then you know give GMing a shot, uh, running short scenarios maybe running a very short uh, adventure. And then, you know, once you become comfortable with doing it, you'll, you'll see that there's a, you know, there are some people that just GM and, and you know, there's other people who just play the game. And, and it's, it's hard to, um, it's, it's hard for people who are in either of those two camps to kind of cross over and, and do the other thing. So it's always best to, you know, to do a little bit of both as much as you possibly can. 
and 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 don't be afraid to jam because jamming is uh, is a totally different experience, and it has you know different risks and rewards involved with it. Uh, you do take on a lot of responsibility as a GM, as far as you know having to create adventures and you know then running through them and and for them to have some kind of a you know a continuity from going from one to the next, uh, from one adventure to the next, and and kind of managing those, uh, the number of players that you have. And I am going to get back into that idea about the number of players and, and do a comparison to some things that I've seen, you know, as of late. So um, that'll be at the very end. Non-standard, what happens if the dungeon inhabited by trolls, hordes, is sacks of gold? You have a typical scenario, and by typical I mean boring, be unique. Yeah, throw throw like little curveballs in there every once in a while. And memorializing. After the session is over, put your thoughts down on paper, record the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, another thing I would do is if you're doing a if you're doing tournament tournament play, um or you've wrapped up a campaign, let the players memorialize their experience as well. Uh, have them jot down, you know, what did they like most about it? What did they learn about the game system the most during this session? Um, do they intend to play this, this game again? Do they intend to jam? Uh, what was it about what you did that, um, you know, that made them want to jam this game system, you know, or, or maybe even, you know, the adventure that you had just run. So um, memorializing is very important for both the GM to do as well as the players. And so we go back here into the credits now. Um, and you can see created by Avengers Satanis, published by Cor Cortalis Publishing, the layout by David Guile, if I mispronounce names, sorry about that. Adobe Stock for the art. Uh, proofreading by Martin Tepley. Definition of old school uh, renaissance provided by Wikipedia. And this is one of his newest, uh, newest products. Chalt, I believe it's pronounced. It's a 5e product, I believe. Um, I haven't actually gotten into reading very much about it or you know certainly not purchasing it so let me switch here so I hope you enjoyed that 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 run through um, and once again it is free on RPG uh, drive through RPG so you can get it for free and uh, it, it's a good read and and you'll see as as I did when I went through it that there were parts of it that I agreed with there were parts of it that you know, I, I disagreed with and, and, you know, there's always something that when you read it, you're going to tweak it and use it, uh, you know, for your own purposes as well. Getting back to that, um, that issue about group size and that, that debate between old school and, and newer, uh, newer views of role playing is that, um, that rule zero and that rule one, where the GM is really the the final arbiter of what's going on at the you know in with the rules with the with the actual story of the of the adventure that you're running, and you know how everything is being conducted at your game table. That kind of runs against the whole idea of um, player agency. And when, when we hear about player agency in today's more modern view of role-playing games, you, you'll see that they're, they're talking about, well, what the players want out of the game session is actually um, paramount, you know, the most important aspect. And the GM... What, what that person wants in the story that they're telling themselves is that that's not important or, or that that is secondary to what the players want. And if, if I go back to Monty Cook's 
you know, consent in gaming, it was, the GM was completely powerless in that decision. Um, where it's like, if the players objected, the, the GM had to remove it from the, you know, from the game session and, you know, even apologize that it happened to have been in there without the players either understanding that it could happen or without the players explicitly consenting that it occur. And, and to me, that is, you know, certainly the direct opposite of what old school renaissance uh, was. And, and, and back when, you know, when I first started playing um, as both a player and as a, and as a GM was that, um, you know, we were the ones that made the, you know, the GM made the game. The GM decided, you know, this is the adventure your players are going on, your characters are going on. Um, this is the flow of it. This is, you know, this is how we're going. And it, it wasn't railroaded in a sense that players still had to interact with what they were putting in and they could still take it into different directions. But ultimately, the story wasn't going to get radically altered by the players. The story was still there. The, the, the basis of the story was still there. Um, today, we see, uh, it, like if you look at Critical Role, I think, I think they have like seven or eight different players, you know, in one group. And old school role playing, I think, was more developed around a group of five or possibly six where you'd have four or five players in one GM as opposed to having eight players. Now, why, why does that make a difference? Because with a much larger group of players, the GM loses his or her agency over the table and the rules and the story that's being told. And, and I, I think that's partly by design. Um, the other thing that having a very large group of players is that, you know, once all of their characters are, are into the action, when you have so many different characters and so many different mixes of, of abilities, and if they start becoming so accustomed to, you know, creating a synergy between, you know, the different class types and, and how they work together, uh, it becomes not only more difficult to create challenges for them w without becoming very extreme, but uh, it becomes extremely hard to, you know, to sufficiently challenge or, or even greatly harm or kill any characters in that kind of situation. And then when you, you have systems that are, that are really designed for player characters to be pretty powerful, even at lower middle levels unlike older school RPGs <coughs> you, you kind of create the the perfect storm of you know too many elements that are just taking that that element of risk out of the game and the story becomes you know what the what the players you know almost exclusively are looking for and that's when, when they start getting bogged down into, you know, well, I want to know what, you know, what's this bartender's total story? I, I want to get into this. I want, you know, I'm not worried about the, you know, the adventure that you had, um, um, you know, planned. I want to spend all my time socializing and, and learning about, you know, the small hamlet and every single individual in this hamlet. And, and it, it just loses focus. And, and I think that's the, the key role for the the GM is to you know there's a reason why it's called game master um, they need to be the master of the game and kind of direct the the essence of the story you know along a particular line that they were looking to uh, to create and so um, so once again um, I hope you enjoyed this encourage you to you know pull this off um, drive through RPG your, yourself and, and give it a good read. Uh, compare it to other, you know, other ones uh, of its kind uh, out there. Um, like I said, Venger has some other 
variants of this, you know, how to, you know, how to GM like a boss, how to be a player character like a boss and such. So you can certainly add those to your, uh, to your collection and, uh, and give them a look as well. So thanks for joining. Uh, we're just about into the, you know, the real holidays for the, the week. So I'm going to be gone for a couple of days. So, um, I look forward to seeing you on the gaming screen sometime soon. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed, please consider subscribing and uh, leave your comments in there. Uh, I recently got a comment about uh, this particular screen right now where you see the split screen between the camera and the, uh, and the image that I threw up there. And, uh, you know, the person had, had mentioned that, you know, he, he wasn't crazy about the distortion that was taking place. And that's, that's because I was cropping the image. So um, you can see there's like my wedding picture is behind me over there and that's usually I usually crop that down and it kind of distorted the image so if this is what you were talking about um, this is just the the regular camera view without um, without stretching it and and cropping anything so so let me know if uh, if that's what you were talking about because I was a little bit unsure and, uh, and and it's a perfect example of how I'm trying to uh, you know I always try to respond to your your comments and uh, you know, try to address them if I if I can if I can figure out that that's what you're talking about. Um, so I, I certainly welcome any kind of uh, any kind of critique, a criticism, or you know, certainly any praise. You know, certainly welcome as well. So enjoy the rest of your week. I look forward to seeing you on the gaming screen sometime soon, and uh, we'll see what the you know presents what I get uh, over the next couple of days, and see maybe I'll have some some new games to show off. Um, by the weekend. So you'll have a great week. Thanks for joining.